morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Now we'll continue where we left off in the book yesterday, The Footprints of the Jesuits by R.W. Thompson. The heat is really turning up against the Jesuits. They've been uh, issued a bull by the Pope condemning their idolatry in China. And they, after a full investigation by Cardinal de Tournon, and uh, it's not looking very good at all for the Jesuits. He says, no language, <clears throat> and by the way, if you're following along in your own copy of the book, we're in the second full paragraph on page 214, just backing up a little for continuity this morning. Speaking of this bull by the Pope, it says, no language could be plainer or more emphatic than that here employed by the Pope. It was not uttered in a mere brief, which the Jesuits insist may be changed to answer any subsequent emergency, but in a formal pontifical bull issued ex cathedra, and which, if the popes were, were infallible, must be accepted as of divine authority. Okay, so we're talking about an official bull of the pope, the highest order of of uh, writing, it comes ex cathedra, that is, from the throne, and it is endued with the papal decree of infallibility. So, while the Jesuits may argue that it was a, a mere, merely a brief, and that it could be changed, this author demands that it was a bull. And it says, but whether called by one or the other of these names, either a brief or a bull, it was the solemn action of a pope, the head of the church, and as such, according to the teachings of the church, was final and binding upon all who professed, uh, who professed fidelity to it, that is, to the church. And... It would have been so regarded by any of the ancient monastic orders, that is, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and on and on and on, and by all who had respect for the authority of the church. But the Jesuits did not represent either of these classes, and as the power of the Pope was not sufficient to change their course or unsettle them in their purposes, they continued to persevere in their disobedience with an utter disregard of the consequences. They went to the extent of persuading the emperor of China. Now, this is typical of the Jesuits. Whenever they go into a country as missionaries, they first ingratiate themselves to the ruling classes of the nation, becoming their confessors and educating their children, giving them advantage, helping them to maintain their control over the nations over which they rule. So whenever push comes to shove and the Jesuits get in trouble, they simply rely upon the alliances that they've made with the kings of the country in which they, they, they are missionaries and use them to help overcome their adversaries, even if it's the Pope of, of Rome. And this is another example of it. He says, they went to the extent of persuading the emperor of China to order the arrest of Cardinal de Tournon, which was done by the bishop of Macau, who was one of their tools, one of the tools of the Jesuits, who caused de Tournon to be loaded with chains and thrown into prison, where from ill treatment he died. Okay, the Jesuits have indirectly killed a cardinal who pronounced judgment against them and who was backed up by the Pope. And here later we're going to see that they actually, the Jesuits actually killed a Pope. Not one, but two, uh, uh, according, uh, at the time of their suppression. And obviously, as history reveals, they've killed many Popes that have, that have opposed the Jesuit order. Now, continuing where we left off yesterday on page 215, if you're following along, it says, These incidents, so unfavorable to the peace of the church, 
threw the questions into abeyance again during the succeeding pontificate of Innocent the Thirteenth, after which it was assumed such ma- it, it after which it assumed such magnitude and importance that Benedict the Thirteenth was compelled to deal with it both energetically and sternly. So we're talking about a, a period of rebellion against the church that the Jesuits were opposed by successive pope by successive popes pontificates this has been a long standing problem okay we're not talking about just the Jesuits running afoul of one or two popes this was a long extended period of rebellion as a matter of fact we earlier recognized that it was over a century where the Jesuits were opposed by the popes of Rome and it says, uh, it says, this he did, dealing with them energetically and sternly, it says, this he did by further confirming the decree of Cardinal de Tournon and the bull of Clement XI, reasserting the unchristian practices and conduct of the Jesuits. But even this did not overcome their obduracy. And the next pope, Clement XII, was compelled to issue still another bull, Confirming those of Benedict the Thirteenth and Clement the Eleventh, the world has never furnished another instance of such flagrant and persistent disobedience as this. Even another pope, Benedict the Fourteenth, found it absolutely necessary to issue two additional bulls of censure and condemnation against the Jesuits, in both of which the decree of Cardinal de Tournon was approved by the words of express reaffirmation. So now you can see, <clears throat> we're talking five popes here. And it says, he intended and expect to, expected to settle the matter finally and terminate the long-continued disregard of the church authority by the Jesuits. Nevertheless, like his predecessors for many years, he was compelled to realize that he was dealing with an adversary whose ambition was insatiable and whose capacity for intrigue was without limitation and as untiring as the wind. That's the Jesuits. Untiring as the wind. They won't be limited, not even by the popes. And this author's correct. It appears from all the evidence that he's given that the Jesuits are eventually going to defy the papacy and take it over. As it's implied, even in the constitution of the Jesuits, approved by Pope Paul III when he instituted this this this, this uh, organization called the Jesuits. And we see, for the first time in Roman Catholic history, a Jesuit as Pope. Now, taken... Taking that fact alone, that we have for the first time in history a Jesuit pope, and hold that in the context of the history that R.W. Thompson is revealing in this book, what could this bode for the world, having a Jesuit pope? And he says, De Montour tells the result, but omits any comment upon the triumph of the Jesuits over the popes who passed censure upon them, and sought to impose restraints upon their conduct. He speaks of the, quote, discord between the other missionaries and the Jesuits, the former, that is, the other missionaries, reproaching the latter, that is, the Jesuits, with not fully and frankly observing the bull, unquote, and makes the discomfiture of the popes palpable by adding, quote, These disputes lasted till the dissolution of the society, unquote. These disputes lasted and were maintained until the Jesuits were suppressed and abolished by a papal bull. No no sign of turning with these Jesuits. No sign of capitulation. They are a loose cannon, okay? They've got their own agenda, and they won't even allow the popes or the church to get in their way. 
Now, it says this equivalent, uh, this is equivalent to saying that the only way to bring them into obedience uh, to the church was to dissolve them. We shall hereafter see, however, that they did not even obey the act of dissolution. As the society was originally established by Pope Paul III in 1540 and was abolished by Pope Clement XIV in 1773, it thus appears that considerably more than one half of the period of its existence had been spent in open and flagrant resistance to the authority of the popes and the church, a pregnant fact which no sophistry can palliate or explain. But, as our inquiries proceed, there will be other years of resistance to add to these, along with such combinations of circumstances as to show how the Jesuits became odious to the Christian world and how rightfully it was dissolved. How rightfully it was dissolved. Now, we're going to begin now chapter uh, 13 in the book. It's entitled Papal Suppression of the Society. It's Papal Suppression of the Jesuits. Push has come to shove. The odium of the Jesuits is felt all over the so-called Christian world. The kings uh, that ruled at the behest of the Pope in Europe were, were absolutely outraged by the Jesuits. They wanted them gone. Everybody wanted them gone. And finally, even the popes had to acquiesce. And they were suppressed in 1773. Now, it says when Pope Clement XIII became pope, in 1758, events which had grown out of the conduct of the Jesuits were hurrying forward so rapidly that even he, with all the existing pontifical power in his hands, was unable to arrest them, although, as the patron of the society, he endeavored to do so. There was no longer any ground for compromise. Their persistent disobedience of royal authority and interference with the political affairs had made it necessary for the governments, that is, the papal kings, the governments of, of Europe, to decide whether they should further submit to them or vindicate their own authority by whatsoever steps were required. In Portugal, the culminating point was reached by an attempt to assassinate the king. All right, here we have a case of the Jesuits attempting to assassinate a head of state. In Portugal, the culminating point was reached by an attempt to assassinate the king. The actual perpetrators were arrested, tried, and executed. But in the course of the investigation, it was developed to the satisfaction of the public authorities that the deed had been incited by the Jesuits, who had impressed ignorant and fanatical minds with the idea that no wrong was committed by killing a heretical king, that is, one who did not submit to their dictation. That's right. The the the, or the, uh, the, the Jesuits include in their oath uh, 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 an intent to kill heretical kings. And in their definition, a her heretical king is one who will not submit to Jesuit authority. Now, they instigated and helped execute the attempt to kill the king of Portugal because he opposed the Jesuits. And this is exactly what happened to President Abraham Lincoln and John Fitzgerald Kennedy in this country. He says... They impressed ignorant and fanatical minds with the idea that no wrong was committed by killing a heretical king, that is, one who did not submit to their dictation. An effort was made to place three Jesuit fathers upon trial, so that if found guilty, they might also be properly punished. But these Jesuit fathers were, both, were bold enough to defy the government by insisting that, as priests, they were not amenable to the civil laws of the state, even for felonious acts, but could only be tried by an ecclesiastical tribunal under the jurisdiction of the Pope. 
Roman Catholic canon law demands that the priests are the representatives of and under the sole jurisdiction and authority of the Pope. And the civil law, the civil powers, cannot touch them. And even if they commit a felony, even if they commit a felony, the civil power, that is the national government, have no authority over the priest. They can't arrest them, they can't try them, they can't... uh, uh, issue judgment, and they can't per, uh, execute them. They're simply and solely under the authority of the papacy. And this is why, in the United States of America, all Roman Catholic priests who fall under this canon law of protection should be regarded as hostile uh, a, uh, hostile ambassadors of the Pope and not citizens of this country. In other words, a fifth column within the country, wholly opposed to our institutions, our Protestant institutions, our way of life, our form of government, and every other thing, and they should be registered as spies by the federal government and their whereabouts should be reported on a regular basis. And if I had my druthers, they'd load up all the the derelict ships in this country with them and put them out to sea and let God determine what to do with them. They form the shadow government of the United States of America. They are the ones who are steering this country to its doom. And it that 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 course toward doom is maintained by the people of this nation by failing to recognize what purpose these Jesuits and these Roman Catholic priests serve in our nation and demand that something be done about it. And the first reason that no action is being taken by the incredulous people of the United States is simply because they don't they, they continue to believe that Roman Catholicism is Christianity. Just another denomination of the Christian faith. And it is no such thing. And especially not the Jesuits who even defy the, the, the infallible, as it were, authority of the popes. Now continuing, he says the king and Pombal could easily see that this defiance of government authority over the temporal affairs of the kingdom could not be submitted to without bringing the state into dis, uh, into disgrace and endangering its existence. Hence, as a measure absolutely essential to the life of the nation, we're talking about the survival of Portugal here, the king issued a decree of banishment against the Jesuits as traitors, rebels, enemies to and aggressors on his person, his states, and the public peace, and the general good of the people, unquote. That's exactly what the United States needs to do. Issue a decree of banishing against the Jesuits as traitors, rebels, enemies to and aggressors on our state and our public peace and the general good of the people, just like Portugal did, a Roman Catholic country. He says the Jesuits were then seized, transported to the states of the church, that is the papal states, under the jurisdiction of Pope Clement XIII, and the three accused Jesuit fathers were placed in prison to await his action. Now remember... (laughs) they wouldn't submit to the the civil authorities of Portugal because they were Roman Catholic priests. They were of a higher authority. They were only subject to the Pope's authority. So the Portuguese government, exercising the only power that they literally had over the Jesuits, expelled them out of the country and sent them back to the Papal States. Okay? Okay. See, see the twistedness of this? 
why does the United States or Portugal or any other nation in the world acquiesce to this canon law decree that popes are not, and popes and priests and Jesuits are not subject to the civil power? This is what allows the priest pedophile pandemic to rage unchecked all around the world. The civil government has no jurisdiction over these pedophiles. They claim that their only jurisdiction is under the papacy. And only the papacy can do anything about it. I tell you, it, it's to the point where people are going to resort to taking law, the law into their own hands. Can you imagine being a parent in this country and finding out that a, that a Roman Catholic priest has sodomized your little boy and that the police, the state authorities, the federal authorities can't do anything about it legitimately or legally, and that if justice is to be served in the matter, that it must come from the Vatican, who protects these Roman Catholic priests? Now, people are beginning to wake up to this can- canon law of immunity that is enjoyed by these pedophiles. And they're going to start taking the law into their own hands. This is what needs to be done all over the world. He says the Jesuits were then seized, transported to the states of the church, that is the papal states, under the jurisdiction of Clement XIII, and the three accused Jesuit fathers were placed in prison to await his action. The Pope defended the Jesuits. See, that's what happens when you turn these these traitors, these fifth columnists, these spies of the Roman Catholic Church. This is what happens when you turn them over to the Pope. He defends them. He says the Pope defended the Jesuits and threatened the king of Portugal with his vengeance if he did not revoke his decree against the Jesuits. But the king could not submit to interference with the temporal affairs of his kingdom, even by the Pope, who by his approval of the Jesuits had shown himself willing to see the governments humiliated by them. Okay, This is the case, of course, that the papacy is always going to take, and especially when there is a Jesuit sitting in the papal chair. Do you see, you beginning to see what significance it has that a Jesuit now occupies the papal chair? The Jesuits have their man in Rome. And what, what is about to happen can only be speculated upon. He said, but the king could not submit to interference with the temporal affairs of his kingdom. What, what's the matter with the government of the United States? I mean, this king in Portugal manned up, didn't he? What about the President of the United States? What about Congress? What about the Senate? What about the Supreme Court that sees all the corruption of these Jesuit priests and remains silent about it? As if to bring attention to their crimes, they embarrass or humiliate God himself. It's time for us to man up in this country. It's time for us to man up and do what the Roman Catholic countries did around the world against the Jesuit order for their political intrigue, for their assassinations, for their corruptions, and for their defiance of civil authority. Man up, America. We'll be back right after the break. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com Worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. In this day of economic uncertainty and soaring unemployment, safe investments are often hard to find. But investing in the precious metals is the safest investment of all because gold and silver is real money. Government printed currency is not. Call Melody Cedars from a discount gold and silver trading company at 1-800-375-4188. Melody has been helping people secure their financial future for over 10 years. While others in the business claim honesty, Melody will deliver. Give her a call, 1-800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And if you'd like to hear Inquisition Update continue here, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. Now, the Jesuits made an attempt on the life of the king of Portugal because he opposed them. And the king of Portugal found out about it and arrested these these three Jesuit popes or priests and observing canon law refused to take law into his own hands and he delivered them to the Pope for his justice and it says the Pope defended the Jesuits and threatened the king of Portugal with his vengeance if he did not revoke his decree against them this is what happens when you let the fox watch the hen house And he says, but the king could not submit to interference with the temporal affairs of his kingdom, even by the Pope, who by his approval of the Jesuits had thrown himself willing to, uh, who had shown himself willing to see the governments humiliated by them. That's what's happening today. The government of the United States is humiliated by these Jesuits because they do whatever the Jesuits tell them to do. They pass the legislation that the Jesuits want passed in this country. There isn't a man in Washington, D.C. that isn't under their influence, because if there were a man in Washington, D.C. that was not under the influence of the Jesuits and not fearful of the Jesuits, they would be on the mainstream media identifying to the American people what influence the Jesuits have and what diabolical legislation they propose, and they would out this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order that is being propounded around the world and enforced around the world by the American military. Any any politician in Washington, D.C. that ever stands up and tells the truth to the American people will be summarily dismissed as a heretic and a psychopath and an uh, unpatriotic traitor. They put so much pressure. Look, I can tell you from my own personal experience, 
When you expose the influence of the Jesuits in Washington, D.C., you're labeled as unpatriotic. And they can raise all kind of hell against you. And I've been subject to it, personally, and paid a tremendous price for being outspoken against the Jesuits and against their influence in Washington, D.C., and the corruption that they have incited in Washington, D.C. But if it's not up to the little people of the United States, if it's not up to us, how can we expect any of these people who love their political power to expose this Jesuit intrigue that's taking place in Washington? They know what power the Jesuits have. They have the power to assassinate kings and heads of state and go away scot-free. And not only that, but if they are resisted, they not only get killed themselves, but their sons and daughters are subject to the hatred of the papacy, as history has has made clear. It's up to the little people. If it's not up to us, nobody is going to do it. It says the king of Portugal could not submit to interference with the temporal affairs of his kingdom, even by the Pope. Hurrah for this Roman Catholic king of Portugal that wouldn't allow the Pope to interfere in its temporal affairs. This Roman Catholic king of Portugal would not tolerate the Pope interfering in the temporal affairs of the nation. Would to God that there was that much wisdom in the United States today. He said the king could not submit to interference with the temporal affairs of his kingdom, even by the Pope, who by his approval of the Jesuits had shown himself willing to see the governments humiliated by them. Do you suppose that if anybody brought a, cal- a calumnization against the Jesuits in Washington, D.C., you suppose how many of, of the, of the uh, politicians in Washington would defend them? You can better believe Nancy Pelosi would, and I believe President Barack Obama would, and he would even use American military forces against his own people here in this country if there was any organized op- uh, opposition raised against the Jesuits who control his presidency. But this Roman Catholic king had some fortitude. He had some chutzpah. And he kicked the Jesuits out. And the papacy did what it always did. It defended the Jesuits and condemned the king. Our government's afraid of condemnation by the Pope. That's why they won't kick out the Jesuits. Is this, does this show impress upon your mind just how much influence the people really have in the government of the United States? The Bible confirms the fact that we don't have any say. It says the kings set themselves, and they take counsel together against the Lord. That's exactly what they're doing, even in the United States of America. They take counsel together against the Lord because they're united with the Jesuits, who want to set up a global government, a global religion, and a global economic system, and a global a social system of their making. They want to overthrow the legitimate throne of Christ in the world and in the universe. And the American people are ignorant to it. And it says, The king of Portugal, accordingly, withdrew the Portuguese ambassador from the court of Rome and proceeded against the three Jesuits who had remained in prison under suspicion of having planned the attack upon his life. The chief one of these was turned over to the Dominicans, the natural enemies of the Jesuits. And here's something that the warriors for Christ ought to exploit. 
that the Dominicans are the natural enemies of the Jesuits. The Dominicans absolutely loathe the Jesuits because the Dominicans were the those who ran the Inquisition for the Roman Catholic Church. They're the ones who burned at the stake God's people. And the Jesuits, when the, the latecomers, the Jesuits, they took over the Inquisition from the Dominicans and stripped them of their main office, stripped them of their main purpose for existence, burning heretics. Now, it says the chief one of these was turned over to the Dominicans. They turned over one of the Jesuits to the Dominicans, the natural enemies of the Jesuits. Guess what they did? It says, by whom he was burned alive, and the other two were condemned to imprisonment for life. So the Dominicans got the job done. They burned one Jesuit and put the others in life, life sentences. Something to think about. It says, the people of Europe became greatly agitated at finding in their midst so formidable an enemy to the public peace and quiet as the Jesuits. That's the people of Europe. Roman Catholic Europe became so greatly agitated at finding in their midst so formidable an enemy to the public peace and quiet as the Jesuits. You still have to ask yourself once again, why has not this assessment been made by Protestant USA? Roman Catholic Europe took action against the Jesuits, a Roman Catholic monastic order. But Protestant America can't lift a finger in opposition to the Jesuits. It defies reason. It says, this agitation was increased by the trial of the society for the debt of Lavalette before he, uh, before the Parliament of Paris. Remember, he's the Jesuit that was engaged in commercial activities and went bankrupt and couldn't pay his creditors. And when he was hauled into court, into, into, the, in, into court for failure to, uh, meet his obligations, he tried to defend himself as a member of the Jesuit order under a constitution that forbade him to practice. And so they sued the Jesuit order to, to, to recover the debts owed by La Valette. And that's when the constitution of the Jesuits was exposed to the world public. He says, this agitation was increased by the trial of the society, the Jesuit order, for the debt of Lavalette before the Parliament of Paris, which resulted, as already stated, in bringing to light the odious principles of the Jesuit constitution, the exposure of which is represented as having produced, quote, alarm and consternation among all classes of society, unquote. All classes of society. So the knowledge of the constitution of the Jesuits was spread all over Europe. The world, for the first time, got to see what the Jesuit order was really made of. What was their real purpose in the world? And the odium against the Jesuits was universal. It says in France, the Jesuits made an effort to arrest the public indignation by procuring the decree of quote-unquote, 50 bishops who, under the auspices of the nuncio of Clement XIII, certified that the principles of the Constitution were harmless. <laughs> so the Jesuits, in their defense, gathered up 50 bishops who tried to convince all of Europe that the Constitution really wasn't what it appeared to be, right? What was publicly exposed to the rest of Europe, the people were ready to have the Jesuit order abolished because of what was revealed in the, Constitu uh, the Constitution of the Jesuits, the Jesuits even went so far as to try to get 50 bishops to say there was nothing harmful in the Constitution of the Jesuits. And it says, but this adroit movement failed to produce the desired effect. 
All right? The word of 50 bishops did not add up to the universal odium of the Jesuits by all of society in Europe. And it says, but this adroit movement that is using 50 bishops to disarm the matter failed to produce the desired effect. In other words, Europe remained absolutely definitive. The Jesuits have to go. And it says the Parliament, the French Parliament under the head of Chaucel, the Prime Minister of Louis XV, refused to permit an edict to that effect to be registered. All right? These 50 bishops issued a statement outlining the harmlessness of the Constitution and wanted it published, and France... The French government simply wouldn't allow, allow it to be published. They refused to permit an edict to that effect to be registered. It says, whereupon the investigation into the Constitution and statutes of the Jesuit order was continued for some months and resulted in the enactment of a parliamentary decree which showed the odium then attached to the Society of Jesus, that is the Jesuit order in France, it denounced their doctrines and practices as, quote, as perverse, destructive of every principle of religion, and even of probity, as injurious to Christian morality, pernicious to civil society, seditious, dangerous to the rights of the nation, the nature of the royal power and the safety of the persons of, sovereign, of sovereigns as fit to excite the greatest troubles in states to form and maintain the most profound corruption in the hearts of men. Unquote. That's what they thought of the Jesuit Constitution. He says it would be impossible to find language more expressive and when it is considered that it was uttered by a parliamentary body composed only of those who maintained the faith of the Church of Rome, in other words, all of Parliament were Roman Catholic, this is a Roman Catholic nation, a Roman Catholic king, a Roman Catholic Parliament, all serving the Church of Rome, they unanimously despised the Jesuits. They wanted them gone. He says, it may readily be supposed that the most imminent necessity called, called it forth. Okay? To get a parliamentary body to denounce the Jesuits must have been the result of some imminent necessity. It says it will, it will and it will ex in, excite no surprise that the same decree proceeded to provide, quote, that the institutions of the Jesuits should forever cease to exist throughout the whole extent of the kingdom, unquote, and that it also prohibited them from teaching in the schools. Oh, that's a huge thing right there. It prohibited the Jesuits from teaching in the schools from longer recognizing the authority of their general, they could no longer acknowledge, they could no longer obey the Jesuit general, the one who speaks with the voice of God to the Jesuit order, and from wearing a religious dress. In other words, they, ha they had to take off their priestly frocks. Now, this is a, this is a Roman Catholic country. They prohibited the Jesuits from their entire kingdom. They prohibited them from teaching the children in the schools. They prohibited them from acknowledging the authority of the Jesuit general. And they prohibited them from wearing religious dress. That's the attempt that the French government made against these Jesuits. And it says, Clement the Thirteenth feeling himself powerful enough to resist this decree, endeavored, as the friends of the Jesuits, to break its force by issuing a counter-decree of his own. So here's the papacy, desperate to maintain the Jesuit order, because it recognizes 
that it cannot obtain domination in the world without the help of the Jesuits. They defend the Jesuits, and it says, at this point it is worth worthy of remark that the parliamentary decree had reference to temporal affairs and did not in any way interfere with the religious faith of the church, which the French Christians continued to maintain according to their traditions and teachings. Okay, this wasn't, according to France, an attack upon the church or the Pope's so-called legitimate authority over the church. No, this had to do with the Jesuits imposing themselves upon the civil matters of the country. And it says, The decree of Clement the Thirteenth, therefore, was the assertion upon his part of the pontifical right to dictate the temporal policy of France. Remember, the Pope has two keys, his authority over the spiritual and the temporal. That's the problem. Okay, now, me, being a Bible-believing Christian, and believing what is true, that the Pope, the papacy represents Antichrist in the Bible. He's denounced as Antichrist in the Bible. He has no spiritual authority at all over me. No legitimate spiritual authority at all over me. I know who he is. But our government allows the papacy, and by default, the Jesuit order to have authority over the civil affairs of this country. The temporal power of the Pope is extended through our government. Now it says, The decree of Pope Clement XIII, therefore, was the assertion upon his part of the pontifical right to dictate the temporal policy of France. The Pope's going to do what he claims he has the power to do to dictate the government of France. He explicitly asserted this by affixing his papal curse upon all who obeyed the decree of the Parliament and by, by declaring it to be null, ineffect, inefficacious, invalid, and entirely destitute of all lawful effect, and by releasing all who had sworn to observe it from the obligation of their oaths. There's another, another example of how the papacy can take over the government of a nation by rallying the people in opposition and even absolving of them of their oaths to uh, of, of fidelity to the governments. That just goes back to what I've always said. Every Roman Catholic in this country and every other country in the world is a potential fifth columnist. Because if the papacy says you are no longer on pain of excommunication to be loyal to the government of your nation because it's in rebellion against the papacy. It is your duty as a Roman Catholic to abandon your loyalty to the civil government and to wage war against it. So every Roman Catholic is a potential fifth columnist because its first loyalty, as every good Roman Catholic is, is its first loyalty is to the Pope. The God, of, the, the God of the Roman Catholic Church. That he has power over spiritual and temporal things. And so long as the governments of the world are at peace and obedience to the Pope, everything's hunky-dory. But in a, Rome, in, in, a, in a Protestant country, or even in a Roman Catholic country, if the king or the government raises an opposition against the papacy, or is somehow found in a disobedience to Roman Catholic canon law, the Pope can just simply erase any obligation that a Roman Catholic feels to his government. Erase that loyalty by just a word. And then charge them that they are no longer subject to their oaths that they took. And to charge them also on pain of excommunication, separation from the church, and eternal damnation if they don't overthrow that government and replace it with one that is appointed by the, by, the, uh, by the papacy. Now, that's what the Pope intended to do in France. And it says, In the face of this pontifical mandate, however, the decree of Parliament was executed and 4,000 Jesuits were driven out of Paris. 4,000 Jesuits were driven out of Paris, France. 
I suppose Pope Clement the Thirteenth was incensed at this and issued a formal bull in praise of the Jesuits and in denunciation of their opposers. The French Parliament suppressed this bull and refused to permit it to be printed in France. The Parliament of I went even further by having it, quote, torn up by the executioner and publicly burned, unquote, and by inviting Louis the Fifteenth, quote, to avenge himself on the court of Rome and the popes, unquote. In other words, he invited Louis the Fifteenth to raise up an army and to attack Rome and the Pope for trying to overthrow the government. <laughs> Imagine the United States taking that action <clears throat> when it won't even admit the Jesuits have any authority in Washington, D.C., so carefully protecting their investment in this country. But it took a Roman Catholic country, France, to finally put a stop to Jesuit influence and papal influence in the civil affairs of that Roman Catholic country. He says, the king of France, however, was weak enough to suffer himself to be prevailed upon to allow a synod of the clergy to be convened under pretense of putting an end to the disputes between the civil and religious powers as if such a thing were then possible without submission to Jesuit dictation, backed as the society was by an irritable and imp impracticable pope who had vainly supposed himself powerful enough to check the tide of indignation, then beating upon the Jesuits. Impressed by the opinions and policy of Clement XIII, this synod adopted a course favorable to the Jesuits, of course, by endeavoring to change the issue, that is, reframe the, the debate, so as to conceal the real question with the view of making it appear that the church itself and even Christianity was in danger, they fulminated anathemas against the works of the French philosophers of Bale, of Helvetius, and Rousseau, and Voltaire, and of the encyclopedias, thereby furnishing arguments which have ever since done Jesuit service by misleading the unwary into the belief that Christianity and Jesuitism are of synonymous meaning, and that the, the, the destruction of the latter, that is, the destruction of the Jesuit order, would be the death of the former, the death of Christianity. Okay? Everybody viewed these French authors as being a threat to the status quo, a threat to Christianity. And so the Jesuits, shifting the blame... For away from themselves, put all the focus on these French writers as a way to preserve their pr attack. We've run out of time. I'll see you on the program tomorrow. Inquisition update on first. Visit crosstheborder.org, C R O S S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book. The rapture will be canceled. That's crossthborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm 
of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org.